Hi. How are you? Mm -hmm. My name is Hola. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Miguel. I am a Mexican. I'm an immigrant. Uh, but I'm also human, right? Uh, most important, I would say. Those are definitions that someone had told us. Hey, we're going to be Mexican. Hey, we're going to be from the United States. And then we went with it, right? Uh, today we're going to be talking about reclaiming history for BIPOCs. Uh, I will be talking about my own experience, since this is an acronym for different uh, type of uh, humans that we have, right? Uh, and I cannot talk for everyone, but I can talk about my own experience because I want to be respectful for everyone else. We cannot generalize. So how about, first of all, we're going to talk about really weird stuff, really, not really serious stuff, that it's very close to my heart. I, so close that I cannot escape it. So how about we close our eyes and take a deep breath. Let's ground ourselves a tiny bit. Let's do it once again. Maybe one more deep breath. Okay. It is no measure of health to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society. This is something that I have a little bit every day, and it's it's part of the, a little bit of a PTSD that I have. That we will talk about how some immigrants can have a little bit of that, right? Now that being said, I gotta be kind enough to the society that I live these days because I also come from a different society. I, I lived in Mexico for ten years. Um, a little bit of background on me, I immigrated here when I was 20, right now I am 33. I work in the restaurant industry. Um, I've been living in this country in different states. I started living in Florida, I work for Walt Disney. I uh, lived in Aspen, Colorado, in a very high-end place. I got to serve the Obamas a couple times. Uh, I got to serve on uh, uh, Lakers weddings on the highest peak of uh, an Aspen mountain, like luxurious places that you would be like, what? How much millions you spend on what? Textile money, by the way. Um, then I, after that, along my journeys, I met certain special people that uh, opened the doors for uh, immigration, right? And then through that path, I end up living in Vermont. Then I had the opportunity to live in Houston, Texas. And then finally I made it here. Um, why did I make it here? Well, I heard that it was like a white state at some point. So like, it sounds like I could probably put a little bit of a, a dent there, right? Um, and well, let's start with what's what does reclaim mean, right? Since I am an immigrant, let's talk about language, right? I got this from the Oxford uh, uh, dictionary. So, retreat or recover something purely lost, given or paid. Um, along the along the the. the the history of like reclaiming your, your story, because it can be at different levels, right? At this point, I'm gonna start with uh, my story, which was once I, back, fast forward, I meet someone and we make the decision to keep going with what we're doing together. And we thought it was going to be easy or we thought it was going to be not that hard, actually. Uh, so I had to go back to my country for a year and a half, uh, and this is where the pre-immigration uh, trauma on immigrants can start. In my case, I thought it was going to be maybe six months, right? Maybe maybe a year. Well, it took two years for me to get a um, a permit to be here. Uh, a lot of thousands of dollars on my side, on my partner's side. Uh, obviously, things that had to be in consideration. Um, I wanted to be available to see my partner, right? 
but I cannot ask for vacations every, every time she comes down. Uh, so I was not able to get a good job for all those two years. I was not able to come here because since I told them that I wanted to be a resident so I could be with my partner, I could not travel into this country for those two years. So for two years, I lost my freedom of having an economic income. And somehow, when I was 25 years old, I lacked a lot of the emotional intelligence that I have these days. And that started getting me weird. I didn't know. It just happened. Um, in transit, I am privileged because I made it through the legal ways. I had to wait for the two years, right? A lot of people have to travel through deserts, through oceans. Before the time was the thing, uh, before, before we had like airplanes and now you can drink little cocktails uh, on your airplane while you come from, let's say, China or uh, another big one that we have, Philippines, right? Okay. Or from Mexico. You had to probably in the 1840s after the first famine of the, the Great Famine from the Irish, they had to come here on sailboats. Sometimes those crash, they die. You know, I mean, a little bit of that that a lot of people don't even th think about. These days, of course, traveling with a kid, for example. I don't know, sometimes a lot of people don't make it. You know, there's songs that we sing about that. In my language, at least, I don't know if in this in, in, in English, but in Spanish, we do have a lot. Um, administration figures that when you get here, they profile you and they bully you a tiny bit. I've always been bullied when I came here and like I come through the through the through the doors, right? Through the through the legal ways, They're like you, there, office, two hours. Uh, my lawyer has told me several times, I have a lawyer now, I'm a, I'm a privileged person because I, I get to be able to pay for a lawyer. And he literally said verbatim, and I'm quote unquote, be prepared to be harassed and questioned. I know it's unfair, but it has been happening. And I was like, what? Why? That's my experience again. I've been pulled, I've, been lo I've lost lights of how long I've been detained in that little office. Uh, and this is, to my understanding, something that they call a homonymous, which is someone with the same name that I have. Um, apparently, someone did something weird. Obviously, I haven't done anything. My record is clean, and like after two or three hours, I can move on with my life. And I, I always ask them, hey, can we stop with this? Can you use all your money and your tech so you can buy a scan me and like, I don't have to deal with this? To this day, traveling for me, it's very, it just triggers me. Like, just seeing the uniform people gets me weird. The, the fear of like one day just not being able to come back because they're, it's their rules, right? I mean, it's their house. You're a guest. Um, post arrival to the US, once you get here, um, once I got here, I got to live a thing I think called a cult a culturation, uh, which is okay. Now I'm paying. I was always paying. I was. Oh, I've been always paying taxes, but I was very naive. Uh, I was a privileged person. I speak two languages. I can communicate in five. I went to college, um, so I grew up in a in a narrow pers perspective from my country. And when I was working in Disney. I was in the Disney bubble. When I was in Aspen, I was in a very high-end bubble. But when I got to Vermont, there was no bubble. It was a little bit more grounded, you can see. If you can say, there was less diversity. I mean, Aspen definitely was no diversity. <laughs> uh, but I, ne I never saw it because, again, you were just work, house, house, work. And I was here in a different way. I was not, okay, this is home now, right? So I start seeing that there's a lack of, there was a lack of diversity, at least in that state of Vermont. Uh, for the first six months, I was not even able to drive. I was not able, I, I had no autonomy. Uh, again, I was not able to work. I was living on my savings. I was privileged enough because I had some a family here that supported me. Um, 
But when you're 25 years old, on your prime, making money, and then after two years of not being able to make money, trying to be like, what am I doing with my life? They show me a lot of things. A lot of people in the streets, unfortunately, I've seen them talking to themselves. I found myself talking to myself a lot of the time. <clears throat> because not having a job isolates you from other people. And just you start, we are social beings. As introvert as you, as you are, or as I am, I wanted to talk to people. So I, I start seeing that that was the thing, you know? And the more I was here, the less, some people were trying to integrate me, but something was just not clicking. That's what a culturation is. I had to do things that I was, I was not even aware that I was not cool with. Like, <laughs> and, and this is probably the prime of it, like the, the the best example that I can give, they asked me to cut the tree for Christmas. I love trees. I respect them. But it was like an honor to be able to cut the tree for Christmas. And I did not want to disrespect anyone. So I killed the tree. As silly as it can sound, that was something that I still, I don't know, I don't know. Um, and that's when everything really started like, okay, what's going on here? Why am I struggling this much? Um, I started doing some uh, volunteer work uh, because that's the only thing that I could be doing. I started studying, started uh, studying wines because in my uh, hospitality industry, kind of like the next step, it could be working on wine and that's what I do these days. Uh, I work with wine, uh, but I work with the culture behind wine. Why? Because through that, I discover certain things of my country. Well, first of all, I learned the basics on wine, right? French, Italy, uh, Spain, United States. Uh, and then I realized that they were dismissing my country, but I knew that there was wine in my country, right? And I started going through the history and the anthropological issues of that. And I discovered things like, we've been making wine in Mexico for over 500 years. I did not know that. I mean, I knew that there was houses that they'd be making wine for over 500 years, but then I correlated that to what happened 500 years. We did not have grape wines. We got conquered. We didn't get discovered. We got invaded and looted. And that's when I was like, wait, I know the Spaniards came and invaded and looted us. Why do we call it discovered? And I was 25 in a new country, kind of like struggling to uh, integrate myself, right? We are customs, we are food. And I'm like, this is not, they were taking me to Mexican places that I was like, this is not Mexican, but I appreciate the sentiment. Um, so I was like, well, what's, what's going on right here, right? I, went, I started going down the rabbit hole in the educational aspect of the wine. I kept growing on that while I was not able to work. I was starting tired of doing volunteership and I ended up volunteering on renovating houses, uh, tapping trees, of maple, Vermont, right? Uh, but I got to interact with society down there, well, up there. And that's the first time that I actually went into the racial situation. I'd never encountered that before. I was privileged enough to be isolated from it. How? I don't know, but I was. Um, the first place that I got cold, went back, beaner, um, Personally, I never took them as an insult, even though it's considered a slur in this country, because I knew who, from who it came. Uh, I took a minute to kind of like understand who was this person, why would he be talking to me like that. He did. I did feel, it was interesting because I did not agree with this racial issue. In Mexico, we are classist, which is another name for racist, definitely. Uh, if you have money, you better. If you don't, don't even ask. Blue eyes, white hair, it is, it is a thing too. My mom, 
till like two weeks ago, she said, don't go out in the sun, otherwise you're going to get darker. She doesn't even see, she doesn't see that kind of stuff. That's exciting that we grow. So I'm introducing a little bit of that background from Mexico so you don't think I am disrespectful to the community that I am trying to show you, right? We have this thing everywhere. Uh, at some point I gave up on trying to get myself integrated. I just, it was just not my thing. And, and, and I remember I heard from the family that I was just high in the stress, which it's true. I had a stress, PTSD. Uh, I mean, again, I am not a doctor. I am not a psychologist. Take all these comments with a grain of salt. Uh, salt, a salt, grain of salt, thank you very much. Um, and of course, like I said, I did not have the emotional intelligence to identify all this. So my cup start chipping. I start bleeding inside. And the closest people to me were the one who got splashed the most. That start hurting my relationship with my loved ones. And life continued, right? Um, we, well, I and my partner, we went down to Houston and I got to travel through the Carolinas. I got my first encounter with a, a, a person that supported Confederacy. Uh, I saw the first time that he was with the flags over there. I was like, okay, this is interesting. What else there? You know, I started going down the rabbit hole the way I did. Well, sorry, I missed part of this. I, 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 I totally jumped this part. The cool, well, not the cool thing something that ignited my passion for history and the anthropological thing that defies and contests the history that I've been taught in my school in Mexico was that I discovered through wine that Hernán Cortés, which was a new vice king of the early discoverers slash invaded America, he enacted a new rule saying that for every 10 Native American slaves that you own, you will have to plant one grapevine. This was in order for them to have a, a supply for uh, the demand of wine for communion so they could indoctrinate us from the, our politicism into their socialist, into their uh, uh, Catholicism. That's why right now, Mexico is very Catholic. In five years after we, well, after Hernán Cortés enacted this rule, we had 60,000 grapevines. Obviously, this number kept growing to the point that only 75 years down the road, we stopped consuming wine from Spain, hurting the Spanish economy, and it was a different type of problem. Uh, it's important to mention that all the managers of, the, well, the next king, 75 years down the road, asked the managers of the private economy to please get rid of the vines. Obviously, they said no. Since this was a uh, religious conquest, uh, through the Lord's gra uh, grace, they inherited the land. Uh, the priests inherited the land. They were the managers of this economy. And uh, they were ruling the status quo. So why would they change it? Uh, that being said, our Washington happens to be a priest. But he was also a criollo. That means that he was the son of two Spaniards born in the new Spain. In their socialist scheme, they were not seen with the same rights, but he wanted the same rights, that's why he wanted to get rid of Spain. Not necessarily the Spanish system, uh, slavery system. He was outspoken on that. So, I'm gonna pause on that side and I will bring it back a little bit further away, down the road in the conversation. This was like, ooh, this is a very different story than the one they taught me. <laughs> why would they teach me that I got discovered and not use a proper language of invaded, you know, like smallpox killed the population almost to 80%, I think, from where I've read. All the facts that I'm quoting right now have been triple checked. I'm always open for corrections, you know, uh, I could be wrong, but this is something that I've seen through different sources, enough for me to feel comfortable quoting them. But again, the cool thing about learning is that you might be wrong. Okay, mm -hmm. but we did get 
a lot of Native, uh, Native American uh, people dead through the smallpox, chickenpox, and well, of course, violence, right? Um, so life goes on, like I mentioned, going back to the story of my uh, trauma or like the mental health situation that could have happened over here, and I made it to Houston while I was starting to learn by myself through the internet about the history of this country. I have the preconceived idea that this was the land of the free, that this is a, uh, a great place for immigrants. And then I got my first job. I finally was able to, uh, after maybe seven or eight months, I was able to make a living. Uh, so it took me almost two years and eight months to be able to work again. Uh, and the point of me in Houston was to like make some money so we can get about our, back on our feet. And then I learned through the going down the rabbit hole that Oregon was at some point a white state only. I don't know what. And then I learned that if you were a black person, since it was a white state only, and this is in 1844, well, technically 1845, if you wanted to live here every six months, you would get 39 whips until you leave. That was the law. And I was like, Wait, what? I need to get there. And that's why I came here. Of course, I kept learning stuff. I learned about um, the Civil War. I learned about the Black Coats. I learned about Jim Crow. I learned about the laws that didn't really help Jap uh, Chinese people, Japanese people. I learned about the Great Famine from the 1840s. So all this got me a little bit weird. I learned about the 13th Amendment, the 14th Amendment, the 15th Amendment, and I was like, wait, 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 what? I started freaking out a tiny bit, I'm not gonna lie. I was like, wait, I left my family. Mm -hmm. I cannot work for two years and eight months. The cop kept breaking a tiny bit more. I kept bleeding a tiny bit more, and the relationships that I had with the loved one that I had kept getting weirder and weirder. Um, that counts on the mental health outcomes, right? A little bit of that stress, the PTSD, the acculturation, the lack of integration. People were trying, I was like, I don't care. I really don't. Coming back to that, there is no wealth. There is no healthy measure of being uh, well adjusted to a pathologic society. And well, of course, there's protective factors. Um, things that alleviate all this, right? Um, therapy, if you're emotionally intelligent enough to know and accept that you need therapy, if you have the resources. Over here, I just stopped going to therapy because like all the therapies that I was in contact with, they just don't see their life outside. They just, they're not trained into an immigration outcome or like angle. So even to that point, I was like, wait, what? Really? So that's a little bit of my story, right? Um, because of that, at some point, I became emotionally abusive. Now, I'm not justifying any of this. I'm just analyzing why I did what I did. I own my actions. And I abused because I was being abused by the state, by the rules. And I'm not even gonna like talk about like all the stuff that I came across Houston. <laughs> that was another one. It's just futile, really. Uh, but yeah, that kept fitting a little bit of that situation to the point that I started becoming abusive. Obviously, like I mean, I also come from a, a very we're a little bit backwards in Mexico to a certain point, you know, like, I mean, they don't really necessarily promote emotional health or, uh, I don't know, they don't teach you how to clean your, 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 your closet. 
So of course I show up with my own things, right? It's not all in this beautiful country because it is a beautiful country. No one wants to be the bad one of the story. Negation and primal instincts kick in faster and harder than you think. At some point down the road, the relationship had to end. Obviously, I, I learned why. At that point, I was not aware of why. And I was in denial. I was like, no, I got defensive. Regardless, it takes two to tango, you know. Uh, I own my stuff. Uh, and the outcome there is I lost my family that I had here. I lost all the support. That's a little bit of uh, another thing that the year of deportation. It's been a battle with the man after that because I got divorced. Um, I recently gained my residency, probably one year ago. I still have to go with like, I have a file with over 400 pictures of my failed marriage with captions and I had to go through all of them with the council. And at the end they were like, this is not enough for you to break up. It seems very legit. Like, why would you break up? I'm like, Ralph, this is not enough for you. It was enough for her. So the point is like, I was not validated. Uh, the trauma kept just, I cannot close it. You know, I, I'm gonna have to do it again for my citizenship. I just applied for it last week. I'm a little bit afraid about talking about all this because like it's talking about against an administration that, I don't know, that my lawyer told me that it, it's okay. I'm, I'm, I'm working on the First Amendment, you know, free speech. But now we're gonna get a little bit political. Now we're gonna bring a little bit of that bigger scope. Why am I sharing all this? At some point I was a bad person. At some point, I got the fine. I heard it's embedded in your personality. You're not gonna change. I had to sit down. Everything came quiet. Life came to a halt. I was by myself in a country that I was learning that it was not as welcoming as I thought. In a state that he was definitely not wanting me there. In a time where a president was speaking specifically against people like me. I was like, all right, is it time to go? Or is it time to really address it? So I started doing my job. I started working on myself, being kind to myself, to the bad man in the story, owning it, healing. And this is a story about accountability, and healing. Because of the way I got to um, go through all this, which is about the loss of family and support, mental breakdown, depression and PTSD, it pushed me out of my comfort zone, helping me grow. Comfort zone is a great place to be, but nothing grows there. Of course we don't have to endure abuse. No one has to stick around. But something that I've seen in this country is that we love to judge. This person is bad. Should go and do this. Should be punished like this. And I learned throughout my studies of the history that that's just the way this country has always been. Many other countries too. We can talk about that some other time but we're lacking tolerance even when we preach it. Um, if we don't show tolerance, dichotomies become the gap between them, the black and the white, it's just wider. That's why I think that on the bigger picture, we are, uh, we're struggling so much on the political environment, right? I don't think from the story of what I've read so far that we've n never been this divided and I now include myself here because I've been here one third of my life and I think that this is home but we are the reflection of our environment and we need to wonder where we're coming from 
Maja Angelou said, we do not know where we've been. There's no way that we're going to know where we're going to. We are never going to end the, if we don't know where we were, we don't know where we're going to be. Something like that. I'll, I'll have the quote in a little bit further away. I need to hold myself accountable for all these things. This is a little bit of a, I became from a generational trauma from my parents. They did the best they could. No one taught them. And I can see the trauma on them. And I can see the trauma on my grandparents. And I am all my ancestors. I am all their lessons, their recipes, and their deaths. So, bringing this into the higher scope of the society, I think that we can use this little analogy to see how throughout the story of this country, we might have a little bit of that generational trauma ourselves to a certain level, trying to be respectful. You know, I don't know you. I don't know where you're coming from. Just maybe, you know? So, how do we take another deep breath? Because we're gonna go a little bit deeper. Now we're gonna, I'm gonna start talking about me and we're gonna talk about us. So, You don't know where you come from, you don't know where you're going. It's fascinating all the conversation that I've had throughout this country in Florida and uh, in Vermont and Aspen, here. This is the land of the free, everyone's so proud. But the more I study about the story here, I was like, wait, wait, no. How can you say that? I learned about the slavery, that was a lot, you know. These are, I'm gonna show you some laws that this administration, not that cruel one, but the strong administration of where we all live, have done and made legal. They had 365 years of legal slavery. We had the Civil War. This is where they're reclaiming for BIPOCs, that's where it starts. People tend to think that we fought for freedom but it took a whole year and a half for Washington to make the proclamation for emancipation after the Bull Run fight. The reason why they, as far as I understand, the reason why they wanted to get rid of slavery it was because that was a model system that was too powerful. And the land, the white man who had land could not compete economically against that model. If you work your own land, everyone has to work in the same and everyone's like a clean slate on the economy. That was the land of the free meant back then. We need to think the way they think that day. No woman, no man or, or, or bypass, only white men that had ownership on the land. That's why they want to get rid of, of the slavery system. The reason why he, to my understanding, uh, uh, Washington made the proclamation for emancipation was because they were slightly losing against the colonies. And Great Britain was lurking to see if it was a good moment to bring reinforces. But if you make it about freedom for everyone, no one touches it. Also, of course, they were not going to be this outspoken against slavery, because against slavery, because we have the South with an economy base on slavery. If you just make it out of like that, it might create a little bit of dissonance, it might create a little bit of the momentum will be get lost. So I really still don't see where is the freedom here, you know? It was more of a economic, political power situation, right? I learned all that through the free internet. I don't know if I would be able to do this, if I had to go to an educational system that it was parted by the same system, right? Some other stuff that happened. 
The Civil War ended, but then the Black Coats happened. Anyone know what's a Black Coat here? The Black Coats was a uh, set of rules from the Southern government after the Convention of 1865, abolishing the slavery. In some cases, the black slave, enslaved person, now free, had to work with the same owner, free owner, he could not leave. He could not get another uh, employer, so there would not be competition between pay rates. Um, if you break the contract, you could go to jail. You will go back to the same. That's when the 13th Amendment learned. Do anyone understand what the 13th Amendment says? It says that no man can be obligated to work for free on labor unless you're a criminal. Can we relate that to a little bit of that? What's going on these days? So. It got me weird because I started thinking about all this. And I remember my partner saying, do you, I remember I saw this documentary called The 13th Amendment. And she was like, do you, do you feel like this? And I looked over it and I'm like, you don't see it, right? Like, obviously, I mean, we had different skin, skin tones. So we were living in different realities. And that's when I even like, I got even like, you know, like, okay, I'm, I'm on myself here. That was before, so I did not feel seen, even though I was with someone I really care about. And I didn't know, I didn't know how to put words, you know? Um, so the black coats gave room for the Jim Crow. I hope that we are a little bit more knowledgeable about that one. Uh, I'm not even gonna say the next one, but uh, another rule from the 18, uh, 1882, uh, not really allowing Chinese people to come and help on the immigration for the mining and the railroads of uh, San Francisco, um, the residential schools, do we know that one? They were trying to make, they took the special treat that we kept for the Native Americans and we kind of like, we obligate them to be indoctrinated, just like my, my ancestors were indoctrinated by the Spaniards. But this was in 1862. Sorry, no, in the, in the 1900s. This was in the 1900s, last century. Uh, the Gentleman Agreements of 1907, which it was like, with Japan, these Japanese kind of like don't come to, to the West Coast again. Asia was very big on the West Coast. Everything is interconnected. This is something that I learned from my um, permaculture course. It was something that showed me all this information that I was learning somehow relates to the present. You just need to give yourself the time to study. There was the Mexican repatriation of the 1940s. Over a million Mexicans were targeted and pushed down on the border just because they look mestizos. Uh, and of course, I mean, all the things that I am saying here is that there has been a power against the first immigration, the, the first racial pushback was in the 1840s against Irish people. It was not even about color. With the famine, the great famine of Ireland, a lot of Irish people came over. And the colonialists, they, they didn't like it. That's where everything started. But something that I've seen is that it's against all the races. Does anyone know about the Japanese uh, American internment camps? The Midwest, yeah, a little bit of that. Over a hundred thousand and ten, give or take. Almost sixty-four percent of those humans were citizens from here, but because of that pattern of that generational trauma, 
we could not discern the enemy from someone that looks like the enemy. That's why we have the cherry blossoms here in Portland to honor that. That's why we have the Japanese gardens. Portland has always been a niche for healing. They always try to push the envelope. That's why here we have such great food because we have a tiny bit of a safe haven for immigrants. Even though in 2019, 87% of the population of Oregon, it is white. Everything else is BIPOC. 2% is black. That is the census information of 2019. Operation Wetback, that's a special one, 1964. They were literally targeting, uh, again, Mexicans uh, from the south, southwest, actually, this was Cali, trying to push them back. Um, lynching, that was something that it was quite regular. It was a lot, it was permitted. You were not able to marry with, within different races. Uh, obviously, all this gave a nice cozy room for Jim Crow rules. Um, if we do not understand how the imperialistic expansion, anyone knows how we got Hawaii to be a territory here, or the Philippines, or Texas. Did you know that Texas got away from Mexico because we fought against slavery and they wanted to keep slavery? <laughs> So they were like, we don't want to be part of Mexico. You can Google all this. Why do we have time to study all this? I, was I, while I was studying over here, all my friends were like talking about the NFL. Mm -hmm. And did you, see, did you see that last game? Did you see that last play? Always follow the money, my friends. I invite you to question things. How do you invest your time? It will be, a, I think, I hope so, a clear reflection of the future that we want to do. Mm -hmm. And just saying, I don't think we're gonna see it. We're not gonna see that change because we need to re-educate ourselves in a big way that policies won't allow us to see it that fast. So I invite you to do it today at your house with your community. So that's why when someone invited me to come and talk. I was super afraid, but I had to, because to my knowledge on that romantic side of what does an American, even though America is a continent, means to be. I think that's the most reflection of what a, a person from the United States reflects, what the dream of freedom, right? And last but not least, the SB 1070. Just to give you a tiny bit of, this happened in 2010. It was the same as the, um, operation, the operation Wetback. In Arizona, if you look brown, they could stop you. If you were showing suspicious uh, activities, whatever that means, there was no description on the legal side of what this means. They could stop you, and if you don't have your documentation, that's illegal, and you go back to your country. If I don't have my green card with me in Arizona in 2010, I will get deported. I could be legally detained and deported. Now, talking about the Batman, I will not justify racism, but we can study it instead of judging it, the way I study my demons. And I'm gonna read this because this is, an, I got this from a neuroscience uh, uh, page. Prejudice is an evaluation of or an emotional response towards a social group based on preconceptions. Prejudice responses range from the rapid detection of threat or coalition and subjective visceral responses to deliberate evaluations and dehumanizations, process that are supported most directly by the amygdala, orbital frontal cortex, insula, striatum, and middle prefrontal cortex. All this, what does this mean? 
They are very ancient primate parts of our brain. Again, I am not justifying them. I'm just understanding them. When you are out in the wild and you don't have a house and you have to hunt or maybe gather, you match with what it looks like to you. That is how you survive. But we're not there anymore. So why do I bring this neuroscience fact? Through my travels here, meeting racist people, seeing how archaic their thought process could be, one interaction gave me a little bit of hope. The person that called me wetback, the whole person that called me Peter in Vermont, I got to treat him as a friend, at least on my side, for three months. And at the end of those three months, I realized that he was on dialysis. He grew up without education. He was in pain. He had no teeth. Again, not justifying why would he talk to me like that. But at the end of our journey, I was able to teach him that I, maybe I'm a wetback but I'm an educated one. And the way he talked to me at the end of those three months showed me that a lot of things can change. I just needed to be a little bit kind to the racist person. I'm not inviting anyone to do it. I just show them what I did. Accountability. The fact or condition of being accountable, responsibility. One of the things that I've seen that we lacked in this country through the 31st Amendment, the free speech, is a lack of accountability. We can see it with Trump and how he did the, the situation. There was no accountability. The black codes, the new white governments right after the Civil War they just retook all that power and generated the black coats. There was no accountability. The government these days say that this is not a racist uh, uh, a government. My friends, if this didn't prove it, I don't know what else can do it. This is not my rhetoric. This is facts. And again, I could be wrong. I would love to have conversations. I'm all about learning when I'm wrong because that's when I learn the most. I love being wrong. The dichotomy, the left or the right. Woodrow Wilson gave women the right to vote back in the 30s. But also, he did a private screening of the, light, the, the, um, the Birth of a Nation. Have you ever heard about that movie? That movie helped the KKK mm -hmm. to really bring it up. Check it out. And he said, this is history written on lightning. He was a keen supporter of this thing, a president. Reagan or Nixon, Reagan or Nixon, with limitization and the police enforcement, the weaponization of the white woman back in the 20s. Have you heard about Tulsa? Did you know how it started? black man goes into an elevator with a white woman. There's a scream. No one happened. What hap no one knows what happened. They were like, this man did something wrong. And, on the, and, and this August, this past August of uh, 2021 was 100 years of that. Back in that day, it was a different time. Like I said, lynching was a thing. It was a legal thing. They wanted this man that made it something that no one knows what they did, so he, they could lynch him. And they were trying to stop doing that kind of stuff. But because of that, there was an upheaval of a lot of white men with a lot of weapons that killed what he was known at that moment as the Black uh, Wall Street. Which, these days, if that economy power, which it was over 300 blocks of black businesses would thrive, could you imagine? How would that look these days? 
how that region would look these days. Reagan and Nixon with the mentalization and all the, with the 13th Amendment thing that I mentioned that if you're criminalized and profiling all the broken families and I will stop on that because that's a different race that I'm talking about, you know, but that's a fact too. A lot of families, a lot of business could have been developed and a different reality would be shown these days. That was not a legal thing back then. Bush Sr. and Jr. with the tourism and the, and the Patrick art, art that just really made the, the borders really, really ugly for immigrants. The Clintons with the super predators from the 1940s, so Obama and the immigrant incarceration situation, Joe Biden these days with, it has more people on, this, on, on the prisons, on the immigrant side that, that Trump. This is not a left or the right. If we think that we are right when we're talking about these things with a Republican or a Democrat, we're not seeing the bigger picture. We are not being kind to each other. We're not showing tolerance. We're missing the picture. And this keeps going. The cool thing is that we've never been better. We have science, we have internet, we are having this conversation in an eloquent way. Something that it might be happening on the 60s, but with all the Reagan thing and the Nixon thing on the 80s, it just shut us down from the conversation. Let's be careful how we do this. I'm a little bit afraid again of having all this uh, facts speaking outside just like that, especially as me as an immigrant, but if I don't do it, then who? I would like to be conscious. I don't want to be punished. I don't think that's fair. But yeah, we're better than ever anyone uh, than ever before. We have science. We have vaccines. We have uh, research. And unfortunately, I mean, we could have been doing better, especially in this country. Someone very famous said, "Well, I'm okay." Said. Uh, that any country that's spending more money in military than in the rights of your own people, like, what is it that they're doing, you know? We could be doing so much better with the economy, the policies that you voters regulate, with the voting, well, the, the people up there, we stop fighting and we start, like, actually making coalitions. Maybe we can do really cool things. So I'm just gonna finish with, why did I did this? Cesar Chavez, said something really that inspired me. I was not gonna do this, but once social change begins, it cannot be reversed. You cannot uneducate the person who has learned to read. You cannot humiliate the person who feels pride. You cannot oppress the people who are not afraid anymore. Thank you. And uh, well, if you have any questions, I'll be around. <laughs>